What's your schedule like, Jay Diaz? Are you available a little later this morning? Good morning, all. Yeah, I am available until noon today. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to uh, go to Ben, our legislative counsel. Um, we asked for a couple of questions and he checked with NCSL. And maybe you could give us that information. And also on the web page, there is a, um, uh, a document comparing Colorado and Vermont that Ben prepared for us. So maybe you could go over that, Ben. Uh, yes, Senator Sears. Yeah, Ben Novogrosky from the Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, yes, I did prepare the memo comparing S-254 with the Colorado law. Um, that's its equivalent. Um, I also uh, did some follow-up uh, concerning Senator Bennings and Senator White's questions from last uh, round. And then uh, I've done a lot of digging trying to find answers about uh, the effect that such that this law may have on law enforcement agency insurance premiums. Um, with that one, it's the the gist of it is essentially that it's too soon to tell. Uh, a lot of uh, insurance entities, the National Conference of State Legislators, it actually wasn't even really on their radar yet to track, um, but. The NAIC, uh, I reached out to the New Mexico uh, insurance regulators as well and in Colorado. And since these laws only passed in 2020 in Colorado and 2021 in New Mexico, and they both have statutes of limitations of two and three years, it's really, they really haven't had time to see what the impact that lawsuits would have on insurance rates yet. Um, some states have done some uh, sort of uh, task force research. I know Connecticut and Massachusetts has had that. And I just received those documents yesterday. So I'm still in the process of reviewing them. But from a cursory review, it's still more of the same that it's just too soon to tell. Um, there are There is an insurance company in Colorado that is starting to offer uh, insurance policies to law enforcement officers uh, for that would cover you know liability. Uh, those are twenty five thousand dollar policies. Uh, I think for payments of about uh, twenty five dollars a month. However, that's not a broad based policy yet, and, and it's relatively new itself. Uh, so, to be determined as far as uh, the effect on insurance rates. Um, as far as Senator Benning's question concerning the ability of a uh, law enforcement agency to cross claim uh, against a, a law enforcement officer, um, it's, it's not explicitly excluded under this law. However, the law does mention uh, that this is an individual and an individual traditionally means a uh, natural person, not necessarily a, an entity like a law enforcement agency would be. So I believe that the language itself would preclude such a, an, an action against uh, a law enforcement agent or law enforcement officer. However, it's not explicitly excluded. Uh, also, such affirmative conduct in litigation by a law enforcement agency could be construed as a voluntary waiver of its own immunity. And um, it, you know, that would be a strategic decision that a law enforcement agency would have to consider. However, I view it as unlikely that uh, an agency would, makes, would uh, undergo such affirmative conduct and expose itself to liability. However, there are differences when it comes to municipal immunities compared to state level immunities. And that requires a bit more research on my part. However, um, I think the long and short of the, the, the question is just that it's not explicitly excluded. However, I believe that the use of the word individual in the statute um, would preclude an agency from, from pursuing uh, such a, an action. And then Senator White, a follow up to your question as far as who would uh, be on the, who would be considered the employer for say an investigator at the DLC or 
at the Secretary of State. And under the definition of 20, uh, Title 20, Section 2351A, a law enforcement agency is an employer of law enforcement officer. And that definition includes those investigators. So their respective agency would be the, the person subject to, or the, the entity subject to indemnification. So, so it would be the Secretary of State would be the um, law enforcement agency in this case? Correct. Okay. At, at some point, I have another question to throw out to you uh, for understanding, but I don't know when the appropriate time is, Senator Sears. I think after we hear from okay. Wilder and Jay, I was hoping to have a little further discussion. I just thought it would be good while we were waiting for Wilder to get back from the Health and Welfare Committee. Um, and I see she's on board now, so um, we will uh, go to Wilda. Thank you, Ben. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to you after we hear from Wilda and Jay Diaz. Thank you. Thank you. So am I up, Senator Sears? You're up. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, for your record, my name is Wilda White. Um, and I'm testifying here today as um, a policy and training consultant with the Department of Public Safety. I appreciate um, your having me uh, back. Uh, there were some questions that were asked at the end of last session that um, we wanted to do some research on and provide uh, some answers to. I heard the tail end of um, legislative council's testimony about insurance and yeah. that information matches our own. We, there is an insurance company called uh, Primus uh, Insurance Company um, that, that, has, that is offering uh, policies to you know, Colorado officers based on their statute uh, for $300 a year. Also the fraternal order of police um, increased their dues by $7 a month for law enforcement officers based on the increased liability um, from this, um, from that Colorado statute. But as I said last time, the Colorado statute is not really instructive about what might happen in Vermont because the Colorado statute is much narrower than the statute that you have in front of you. Um, and interestingly, when I was listening to the testimony this morning, um, it seemed that most people were only testifying about one third of this bill. Um, you know, Attorney Slay, um, Stephen Gillen, and Mia Schultz were really talking about constitutional violations. Um, uh, Attorney Slay, in particular, talked exclusively about constitutional violations. Um, this bill that you have before you is much broader than constitutional violations. It includes statutory violations and violations of common law. And I think that's where. Um, uh, people to the extent that they are expecting a, a proliferation and litigation, uh, that is the reason for those concerns. Uh, because, you know, currently uh, in Vermont, you know, you can sue people, you can sue law enforcement officers for violations of some common law, and they do have a state qualified immunity, which is a different test um, from the um, federal constitute federal, what they apply in federal courts um, and what they apply particularly in section 1983 actions. Um, for example, that uh, attorney Slade talked about discovery being cut off in federal courts because of a decision called Iqbal. That case is Iqbal versus Ashcroft. It was decided by the US Supreme Court in 2009 um, and it is a case that has that has has applicability in federal courts, but has nothing to do with um, state courts. Um, and that case actually made it more difficult um, for people to sue, not because they they stiffen the requirement for qualified immunity. It's because they stiffen the requirement for pleading um, uh, in in federal cases. Meaning you had to you had to say so much in your original complaint that if you didn't say the courts could just throw your case out and deny you an opportunity for um, discovery. So that's kind of in the weeds here, but I wanted to make that distinction. Uh, first, that it only applies in federal cases, and also that case really has to do with pleading uh, rather than um, qualified immunity. Um, and it, it's a more recent case as well, a 2009 case. But the other thing I want to talk about um, when we think about these, these, these two additional ways that you can 
sue now without having qualified immunity is the types of cases that you're likely to see and why people think um, that we'll see a lot more cases than we see now. Um, you know, now when you have a, a motorist stop, right? And um, well, let's start with the easy case. Right now, if an, if an officer is told to go out and serve a warrant a, uh, a, that looks on its face to be valid and you go out and serve it and you find out later that the warrant wasn't valid, but for reasons that you had no idea because it looked valid to you, currently in, in the you know, state of Vermont, you wouldn't be allowed to rely on the state qualified immunity, which you had a good faith belief that uh, what you were doing was lawful because it looked lawful on, the, on its face and that you didn't have uh, any idea that you were violating anybody's rights by serving a facially valid warrant. So qualified immunity in that case would mean that the person would not recover for you serving that facially valid warrant. However, this uh, statute would get rid of qualified immunity in those types of cases. And so now when an officer is given a facially valid warrant, if it turns out later that that while it looked fine to that officer and it wasn't fine, we find out that it wasn't valid, that officer now is exposed to um, uh, liability because they don't have the good faith exception um, that would protect them. And so when uh, you have, uh, yes. Um, uh, Wilda, I'm just wondering, my reading of the bill was that <clears throat> the only way an individual officer could be personally liable is if their own law enforcement agency found them to have acted in bad faith. So I, I find it with your example, it's hard for me to believe that there could be a situation where that would be the case. Um, thank you for allowing me to be more clear because I'm not really talking about this from um, a police officer's personal liability. And you're right, I'm talking about it in terms of um, taxpayers um, because this has an indemnification uh, provision. And so any judgment that's rendered is going to be paid by somebody and it's going to be paid by taxpayers. So I'm thinking about this more from a policy perspective and, and, and not so much from the, um, you know, are we trying, you know, what, what's going to be the liability of the police officer? Because you're right. I mean, and, and to your point, which you made last time about the way the bill is written, you know, you could always protect the police officer from personal liability because the law enforcement agency could never um, decide that the officer acted in bad faith. And in fact, in Colorado, um, there was a, a suburb outside of Denver that passed an ordinance that said, we will never find our law enforcement officers uh, acted in bad faith. <laughs> that was their response to the bill. So yeah, you can insulate police officers from personal liability, but you can't insulate the taxpayers or the public coffers um, un under this bill. And so if you have something like, you know, the what's happening up in Burlington, somebody gives an order to law enforcement officers to shut down like Sears camp, that homeless encampment, and they feel like, okay, I've got a lawful order from, you know, the mayor to go shut this down. And so they go do shut that down. And they found out later that that wasn't a, that was unconstitutional to do that. The police officers or that law enforcement agency would be on the you know they would be paying for that um, for the damages that result from that on the current law under excuse me under the new law on the current law they would be entitled to the defense of qualified immunity because they thought they had received a lawful order to go exercise their law enforcement function. Turns out later that no, that was not a lawful order without qualified immunity, they would be, the, the, the law enforcement agency would have to pay a judgment in that, in that on behalf of that law enforcement officer. Well, so that's uh, kind of- and, and the only caveat I would say is they would have to be found in court uh, liable. Um, but with that said, I see what you're saying. Yeah, no, yeah, this all assumes that, um, you know, there's been a court process where liability has been adjudicated. Um, so I, I'm just trying to give you, hey, this is how it happens under current law. This is how it would happen under your proposed S-254. And the other thing I talked about was under, you know, current law. I didn't talk about current law, and that's why I'm going to do it now. I talked about how this bill would require 
a, a municipal municipality to pay judgments um, for officers who had been convicted of a crime. So, um, and that would have to come out of the public coffers because insurance doesn't cover um, intentional torts. So the way that happens then, what, what happens currently, if an officer is you know, being threatened, is being charged criminally or is convicted criminally, um, and then there's a civil lawsuit that results, um, what happens now is that you know, there's a conversation between um, the, probably the municipality and the um, person who's suing that officer for civil liabilities. They'll say, hey, look, we don't have insurance coverage if um, you go to trial and get a verdict. And this officer can't pay any, any verdict. And so why don't you take a little money now instead of uh, getting nothing? And so those kinds of cases are settled that way. Um, under this bill, because the bill has an indemnification uh, clause for paying criminal <laughs> judgment, that kind of negotiation won't happen. The person who will have the upper hand is actually the person representing the person who was harmed by that officer who committed the crime. And so they'll be saying something like, pay us this much money because you have deep pockets and we're, you know, we know that we can get it from somebody. Um, so that's another, I think, perhaps an unintended um, cost. The other thing that this bill does that doesn't happen under, under the, current, um, the, the current law is um, it has this attorney's fees provision for you know, statutory violations and common law violations. You know, in the United States, typically people bear their own attorney's fees unless there is a you know, specific statute that, that allows the prevailing party to, um, to be awarded attorney's fees. The Colorado statute is, says they shall, so it's mandatory in Colorado that in those constitutional violations, people are entitled to attorney's fees. In this statute, it's discretionary. It's being left up to the judge. It says they may award attorney's fees to the prevailing party. But what this expands is the types of cases that now qualify for attorney's fees, where before it was only in constitutional cases. Now it's in a case that comes under statute or common law. So if I were a savvy you know, trial attorney, which I like to believe I used to be, um, if I had a car accident case against an, a, a law enforcement officer, I would bring it under this statute rather than my typical negligence statutes because I have a chance of getting attorney's fees under this statute. Um, and then the, the unintended, I think, cost of that is, you know, when people, when there are attorney's fee statutes, you actually have a trial on attorney's fees. So that is, you know, taking up kind of more court time um, in handling these cases. I'll stop there to ask if there are any questions. I, I, I know that um, uh, you've heard a lot of testimony and I, I don't wanna repeat um, what I said. I do think that there was some confusion presented by this morning's testimony because it was exclusively about constitutional law and not really about the whole of the statute and its impact. Um, and, and much of the, I think the testimony was about the symbolic effect of, of ending qualified immunity. I won't say much, but I heard, I heard testimony about the symbol, symbolic impact of ending qualified immunity. And that's kind of my quarrel with this statute is that it's symbolic only, and I don't believe it will achieve, achieve either accountability or uh, more racial justice because uh, <laughs> black people cannot have access to the courts. Um, and I don't think litigation is a way to hold people accountable. For, for this reason, think about this. You have three years to file a lawsuit under this statute. And so if there was a bad actor um, police officer, they would still be on the job for three years before that lawsuit's even filed. It takes about five years or even longer to get through a lawsuit. And so that's eight years that this person that you think needs to be held accountable is still on the job with no judgment. Um, maybe if there's such a bad actor harming others. Um, and, and then at the end, the case is likely settled with no admission of liability. And so no one has learned anything and no one has been held accountable. 
but we've still put out a lot of the taxpayers' money in buying additional insurance premiums, paying additional attorney's fees, paying additional costs for jury trials and additional time for court uh, trials. I think the wiser course is to put this, these additional resources into preventing um, these harms um, rather than trying to litigate ourselves out of this, which I do think is impossible. I'll stop there. I appreciate your yeah, time. I, I, actually, I do have a comment and a question. The question, the comment is I'm reading page uh, on page two of the bill, section D, um, a court may award reasonable attorney fees and other litigant costs reasonably incurred in any action brought under this section in which the plaintiff substantially prevailed. When a judgment is entered in favor of the defendant, a court may award reasonable attorney fees and other litigation costs reasonably incurred to the defendant for the defendant for defending any claims the court finds frivolous. This was an attempt to kind of balance that out. You didn't mention that part of the bill, I don't believe. Um, I didn't mention that part of the bill because I feel like that's a dangerous part of the bill because um, oftentimes for, for, the, for defendants, you know, I mentioned that the prevailing party is entitled to attorney's fees and then a losing party would have to pay the other side attorney's fees. And I... I fear actually for working class people who feel like they've been wronged by law enforcement action. They hire an attorney. The attorney decides that this is worth taking. They go to court, they lose. <coughs> and then that, 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 that plaintiff is on the hook for attorney's fees. Um, I think, and, and the attorney who's, who's, who's told the plaintiff that they think they have a worthy cause is not on the hook for those attorney's fees. Um, and so, I mean, that's another reason that I don't like this bill. Um, okay. Well, um, and, um, okay. That's, you know, that's what makes it interesting. Senator White. Thanks, Senator Sears. Um, Wilda, uh, one of the questions that I had this morning was if the state was held to the same, um, standard as the that was um, the clearly established standard that was um, decided by the Supreme Court in 1982. That, that was a question that I had. And I thought the answer was we could we could set a different standard in legislation. But what I hear you saying is that there already is a different standard for state qualified immunity. Am I misunderstanding something here? You're not misunderstanding um, what I said, no. I mean, so in I think in constitutional challenges under the Vermont Constitution, the court does apply um, the, the same kind of qualified immunity standard. But you know, mm -hmm. these are subjective determinations about whether something's clearly established, which is why you get such radically different decisions depending on what jurisdiction you're in which is why we can say in Vermont, what these egregious cases that get us all upset and angry, we can say that is actually not happening in Vermont because our courts are not applying, not using their discretion to apply clearly established in the most ridiculous ways that make us all angry. What we see happening based on our analysis is that it's a more balanced application in the state of Vermont from our Supreme Court and a more balanced application of this this doctrine in the Second Circuit Court of Appeal, uh, particularly in the last four years, that uh, three or four years that we looked at. Um, what I, but the thing what I said is like for, for, um, like for statutory violations and um, common law violations, the standard is a little different because of course they're not looking about whether constitutional rights were violated. They're, they're looking at whether, um, the, the, what, whether there was a clearly established like kind of right under the the statute or a clearly established right under the um, common law, whatever you're you're suing to, and usually it just comes down to did you, you know, this question of good faith? Um, did you have a you know a good faith belief that you weren't violating anybody's rights? Um, and it's an objective test; it's not a subjective test. Other questions for Wilda? 
Thank you, Wilder. Appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate your time. You're welcome. Um, Jay Diaz is our next witness. Um, Jay, you've written several memos to us. I'm trying to find them now um, regarding the bill. Um, so please feel free to go ahead. Yes, well, thank you, Your Honors. It's great to be with you again. I like uh, that, Your I, Honors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought you would. Um, you would, you, you would, it suits you. Uh, no, I wanted to just say first, uh, thank you to you all for researching and really grappling with these weighty issues uh, about this court made doctrine of qualified immunity. You know, I know at first blush it can seem complicated, as one of the witnesses this morning said, it's baffling. Uh, and that's not wrong. But in the end, qualified immunity is about one thing, one simple thing, privileging state employees and insurance companies over the rights violations of victims. That's all it is. It's privileging one group, of, one group over victims of rights violations. And that's what S-254 seeks to correct. S-254 is about leveling the playing field, nothing more. Now, I wanna talk about uh, the follow-up letter I wrote, and it's really in reference to law enforcement's testimony. Uh, and, and I want to respond to some of, and some of that was referenced uh, uh, this morning uh, with, uh, with Wilda's uh, testimony. And, you know, I'm sorry to say, like, with all due respect to, to Wilda, I don't know if, if it's because she hasn't practiced law in Vermont or, or just hasn't uh, associated with the bar very much, but um, just a lot of what she says about, about legal practice in Vermont and about the how, how rights are adjudicated here and what our courts are like just is not accurate based on my, my 10 years of experience practicing law in this state. So the first thing I'll say is just about the Colorado statute. The law enforcement is saying that it's much narrower than, than what's before you and that is simply false. There are some differences in a couple of ways it is more expansive that the first being the, the, as Wilda said, uh, yes, it's, it includes statutory rights and common law rights, but that's something that Section 1983, the federal civil rights statute, uh, similarly does uh, around statutory rights. So if we're looking at, uh, you know, do we not want to include our anti-discrimination laws as a part of this bill? We want to allow qualified immunity when an officer violates our, our anti-discrimination laws. I don't think so. Do we want to include, do we want to allow qualified immunity to apply if an officer steals from somebody uh, that, and, uh, you know, in the scope of their employment? I don't think so. That would be a tort. That would be under common law. So I think that it's important that these things are included. There's a reason they're there uh, and they are valuable and important for racial justice and for accountability purposes. But the bill is also narrower in important respects. With regard to attorney's fees, as was just discussed, the Colorado bill demands attorney's fees. It guarantees attorney's fees and only to prevailing parties. It, in our bill, in S-254, <coughs> you must be a substantially prevailing party and attorney's fees are up to the court. And as we've seen with the Public Records Act, <coughs> the discretionary standard around attorney's fees in the Public Records Act here in Vermont, Courts weren't providing attorney's fees. Courts are reluctant to do that. And they have good reasons for doing that in some cases, but it's important that attorney's fees at least be accessible. And that's why we have that provision in the bill. I'll, I'll say again, this, uh, the second part of the attorney's fees provision, which would provide it to the defendants in the case of frivolous lawsuits is an important provision that actually goes farther and does more for law enforcement than under current law. There is no, so I think it's important that we recognize that this bill is also protecting law enforcement officers, the individual law enforcement officers in more ways than are available to them under current law. That includes the limit on liability, which under current law is not available to them. Under current law, the state and municipalities do not have to indemnify them when they act in ways that are grossly negligent or will, or with willful misconduct. 
and there is no limit on their li their personal liability. So we would say that this bill actually supports individual law enforcement officers by limiting their liability in those rare egregious cases. I also want to talk about this idea that intentional torts are not covered uh, by insurance. That's just a myth. That is not accurate. Uh, the plenty of intentional torts are covered uh, in insurance policies. It can depend on the insurance policy, but they can be covered and, and, and are covered. It's also important to recognize that where, when police officers are convicted of crimes, which as we all, I think, know is exceedingly rare circumstance, uh, I, I can't think of any time in, uh, in Vermont where a police officer was convicted for a crime within the scope of their employment uh, in my 10 years being here. Um, even when they are charged and convicted, which, as I said, are rare occurrences, they're typically charged with lesser crimes, crimes that, crimes that don't involve intent. It's like, you know, if it was uh, a murder, it would be more likely to be charged as manslaughter. It, or, or be pled down to that. If it was, um, you know, beating somebody up, it would be simple assault. These are not intentional, these are not crimes with specific intent, so they would not equate to intentional torts. So this might just be a misunderstanding, but, but I think it's important to recognize um, that the, uh, what, what, what was being talked about there is just simply not accurate and, and somewhat misleading. So, so I think, you know, there, there are several other pieces to talk about here that have been discussed this morning. Is qualified immunity applied the same in Vermont as it is in, 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 in the rest of the country? The answer is unequivocally yes. We have the same exact standards of clearly established law. We have the same exact standards of there must be particularized to the facts of the case. It is exactly the same. Yes, judges all over the country can make different determinations based upon the case before them around qualified immunity. But that is the problem we're trying to address. The problem is that inconsistency. The problem is that we don't have any kind of predictability when it comes to how a rights violation is going to be treated in any given court. <coughs> that is the problem here, that we can fix this privileging of law enforcement and this inconsistency that um, over victims and this inconsistency within the courts. I think it's clear based on the testimony that law enforcement, at least their representatives are just not understanding what this bill actually does, that it can offer more protection to them in some ways and in most ways really isn't about law enforcement at all. It's about correcting an injustice in the creating accountability mechanisms for agencies to ensure that their officers are trained appropriately and supervised appropriately and ensure that there's trust in the judicial system, uh, particularly for people of color who, as you heard today from Mia Schultz and from Stefan Gillum of the NAACP, don't feel like it's even worth it for them to go to court because they don't think they're gonna get justice. And in many circumstances, they're right. They have good reason to be. It's important to recognize the impact that these, uh, that these legal doctrines that are only exist because the legislature has not acted, uh, the effect they have on communities of color and communities uh, all over the state. The last couple of things I'll say quickly in response to some of the testimony we've heard is that qualified immunity has nothing to do with frivolous lawsuits. It doesn't prevent them or encourage them. It can't prevent it, it, it but it does prevent victims with meritorious claims from accessing justice. And actually under this bill, more will be done to prevent frivolous lawsuits based on the attorney's fees provision I talked about than under current Vermont law. Lastly, it's important that we make it clear that there's no reason to think that more civil or constitutional rights cases against police officers will be brought in, in state court, um, uh, that there will be any kind of flood of litigation. 
The fact is the bar of this state is an honorable one. We take our jobs seriously as officers of the court. And I think we only want to bring cases that are meritorious, that uh, that are serious, and that will lead to meaningful change <coughs> in the system and for, of course, our client. There is no reason to think that that cases uh, that are unmeritor unmer unmeritorious will be brought. Um, and I, I really, it's, I think it's really important that we just question whether that's what what that's going to be like. That is not the Vermont way. We are not actually a very litigious state compared to others. And I don't expect us to become more litigious um, uh, because we eliminate this one legal doctrine. So, you know, I just want to reemphasize about how qualified immunity, what it does, preventing access to justice, it really leaves victims out in the cold. And I think in the follow-up testimony I provided, a follow-up in, in, in writing, you know, trying to respond to Senator Benning's questions about some of those cases. Those are Vermont cases where the individuals, where the courts found, yes, this, the police violated your rights, but no, you are not gonna get any kind of justice. The judgment will actually be entered against you. And in one of those cases, I found out that person actually had to pay the costs for the defendants, the defendant police officers, attorneys. So I think there's a lot of injustice going around <clears throat> that needs to be corrected. You don't have to take my word for it, you know, on, on the fact that cases are, are people are not bringing cases uh, be, when their rights are really violated because of qualified immunity. You can look at some of the, the one of the concurring opinions of a second circuit justice um, Guido Calabrese, who's, who's you know renowned justice um, uh, up there with some of the, the the ones lawyers really look up to, um, you know, he talked about it in an opinion, talking about how, you know, he asked why don't these cases go to court. He said the reason is obvious: people who who want to bring a case either might not know they could bring a case, know how to do it, and even if they go to a lawyer, the lawyer is going to tell them, uh, I. Uh, you're right. You can sue if you want, but I can't take your case because the odds are too great that though the behavior was wrong, and I'm quoting here, uh, under current precedent, you won't win. And this is how it results. This is how people are prevented from accessing justice. He's talking about uh, qualified immunity. Now, now, law enforcement has not dealt with any of the issues that we're really focused on here, the issues of access to justice, what we should be providing to victims of rights violations. And, and I think that, again, the misstatements really lead me to believe that the law enforcement community just is not understanding what this bill does. I think, as David Slay said, removing qualified immunity in a lot of ways benefits law enforcement. And that scrutiny, frankly, is a good thing. It makes us all better. That's why we have transparency laws. That's why we have rights. That's why we can go to court. But in this instance, in these instances, that door, that those courthouse doors get slammed shut far too often on people who deserve justice. As Stefan and, and Mia said this morning, not only will we be able to ensure justice for victims, but we will improve our cultural accountability. We will ensure that people will be able to come forward. Uh, and frankly, we'll ensure that it's not a waste of their time <coughs> to do so. Because when we waste people's time, people who have been, who have had their rights violated, who have had excessive force used against them, when we waste their time by going to court and, and then they, or, or, or uh, we investigate and then they, we say that you can't do it, or um, we can't take the case because of qualified immunity, or even if the case gets through a little bit and but qualified immunity ends the case, uh, even though the court finds their rights were violated, it's, it's, it not only wasted their time, it re-traumatizes them. And that is not the experience we want our clients to have. That is not the experience anyone who's been, who has had their rights violated should have to go through. So I'll close with, you know, this is, a, again, about leveling the playing field, uh, making sure victims have their day in court, a fair shot 
which is what they don't have right now. And this is what Vermonters want. As I said last time I was here, almost 75% of Vermonters believe that qualified immunity should be eliminated for law enforcement. Full stop. Thank you. Uh, Jay, uh, I just, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Senator Sears, go ahead. A uh, uh, quick question. Now, I know there was a case, there are probably dozens of them, but that you've been involved with where the community settled long before you got to court um, or before you got to court. Obviously, the threat of going to court was there. In those cases, um, would this make this bill law make any difference? This bill would make an enormous difference. It would mean that we would be able to tell people you're going to have your rights adjudicated and it's going to be easy for you. Uh, this bill would ensure that attorney's fees were possible, that um, that that cases wouldn't go on, and uh, and that and even if you win on the legal issue, you lose on qualified immunity, and therefore get no attorney's fees, no judgment, uh, no compensation for the victim's injuries. Again, we don't want to waste people's time, and that's what we'd be doing if we brought certain cases right now in state uh, because of qualified immunity even though we feel that their rights were violated and we want to fight for those rights. Um, that's the, that's the business the ACLU is in, of course. So, uh, you know, it, it's happened in a number of situations and we have to tell people, you know, um, you know, we're sorry for what happened to you. Unfortunately, there's not, not nothing we can do about the current state of the law until it changes. We often tell them to, to call you folks <laughs> in, that, in those instances. Yeah. One of the, things that I feel bad about, and you don't need to answer this if you don't want to. But one of the things I feel bad about is after I <clears throat> announced that I was going to be a sponsor of this bill, um, a lot of people felt like I had uh, betrayed law enforcement, that I had caved to the left wing of the party that I was, you know, betraying it, you know, law enforcement, that it was all about um, that. And I feel badly about that. I, I truly do, because it was not my intent to bring down law enforcement. Actually, it was to try to make sure that people got justice and also to um, try to um, make some sense out of a law that I frankly doesn't make a lot of sense. That was done by the court. So whatever happens here, um, whether the bill gets out of this committee, whether the bill gets changed dramatically, which most bills do, um, this is the first time in 50 years or whatever since the 1960s when the Supreme Court came up with the idea of qualified immunity that's been discussed by the legislature and not in the courts. So for that, um, I'm grateful to all the witnesses, and um, if you'd like to comment, Jay, feel free. Any other committee member at this point, too. Thank you, Senator. Yeah, I just want to say uh, the ACLU is not an anti-police organization. We also have represented police, like David Slay, we've represented police officers numerous times here in Vermont and around the country. Uh, we want to increase trust between law enforcement and the communities they serve. Because those communities they serve are the communities that we serve and we hear from them. We know that there's a problem with trust and we know that not just in law enforcement, but in the justice system as a whole. That's, what, that's part of what this bill seeks to achieve. If people can have more faith in law enforcement and the justice system, we as a society will be more just. Thank you. Senator White. Thanks. Um, so Jay, I just have a, a couple questions for you. And I just, and I don't, I'm just trying to figure this out. Um, so I know that when I asked you before about um, why just single out police officers here, the, the answer was pretty obvious because they have more authority and power over us than most people. If qualified immunity is, is a bad legal concept, 
why don't we just get rid of it for everybody? I mean, I, do we know of any cases where a Department of Corrections um, person violated somebody's rights and got off, by, or a teacher or a legislator or the sergeant at arms as opposed to the Capitol police officer? I mean, why would we not just get rid of it if it's such a bad legal concept? The ACLU of Vermont uh, doesn't feel strongly about about that question. It, 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 you know, if if the committee if that's something the committee wants to do, we're happy to take a look at it and and, and think through it more deeply. I think we're open to it uh, because we do believe the doctrine is problematic through and through. Um, that being said, as I said last time, uh, I think that law enforcement does hold a special place in, in our in in our society and and. You know there is uh, and there are important reasons to hold them to a higher standard uh, than most other state employees or government. Are are judges covered under qualified immunity also since they're a state employee and other other um, people in the judiciary system and people outside who who all is covered by so qualified immunity? You'll, you'll be happy to hear that uh, judges. Uh, legislators, and I think your, your counsel can probably advise you on this, judges, legislators like yourselves, uh, prosecutors have absolute immunity. So they are, you are immune from uh, anything you do in the course of, of your, um, uh, in your role as legislators or in, in judges' role as judges. Uh, so there, it's not qualified, it's absolute. Wow. Well, is that, um, <laughs> Jay, is that the case in the, in the if, if the action is corrupt? So, so you you are uh, you are acting in a criminal manner, a conspiracy. Are you still covered in that case? I don't know the answer to that offhand, but uh, the example I like to use around absolute immunity is there's there was a case where a judge. Um, this, I don't believe this is this isn't from Vermont, but uh, a judge uh, got off the bench. Uh, went to a, you know, one of the parties um, uh, that were in front of him and punched that person in the mouth. The judge was given absolute immunity, was immune from suit uh, based upon that action. It's in, in a lot of circumstances, it's pretty ironclad. I thought only diplomats were had absolute immunity, but I guess, wow. I had no idea. I thought. Well, but it, it can't be our Sheldon Silver and so many others wouldn't have been convicted and served by in jail. You know, well, I, it's I, up to the judge, right, to decide whether to uh, apply it's, it or it's, not. It's things in the course of your of your role. Well, but Sheldon Silver is accused of, you know, passing laws to benefit um, his clients in his law firm, using his role to shift uh, clients to his law, high priced clients to his law firm, losing his role as speaker. The only reason I bring that, I mean, I just read his obituary. <laughs> so, um, so I'm not, I'm not sure it, there are limits to that if you, um, that was criminal, not civil. I don't know, maybe there is no way to, Civil regress. Yeah, we could be criminally charged, but not yeah. have a civil suit against us. Yeah. So if I bribe somebody or if I. Um, Careful. If I take money for a vote or whatever, I can be charged criminally under the Vermont statutes, but I couldn't be sued civilly. Is that the way I understand this? I think Ben is shaking his head and so is Jay. So, okay. Thank you. Wow. Um, uh, any other questions for Jay? I know we'll, we'll go back to Ben then. Um, we have a few minutes to continue. Thank you, Jay, for the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I, I thank, thank all you. of the this morning. Um, I found it uh, extremely helpful. Um, and so I appreciate it. 
Uh, ben, um, yes, Senator Sears. Yeah, the your memo. Now I got to find it because I just threw it somewhere else. Ah, here it is. Your memo talks a little bit about, and we've talked a little bit today about the differences between Colorado and Vermont. Um, can you kind of cover that for us? Sure. I'm happy, I'm happy to compare the two, uh, the bill here and the law as well. And I can also, you know, attempt to clarify some of the questions as far as immunity and everything, but I can take those in turn after the review of the, mm -hmm. of the two laws, of the bill and the law. Um, so S-254, as has been said, does differ, but is similar to the Colorado law. Um, essentially, what that law did, it went into effect in June 19th, 2020, uh, and it was entitled a civil action for deprivation of rights. So it's title, the titles are similar. And specifically, S-254 does create a broader basis under which an individual can bring an action against a law enforcement officer. As we have talked about constitutional violations, statutory violations, and common law violations. Um, the Colorado law, however, outlines some other differences, and those include the effect of a law enforcement officer's criminal conviction on indemnification by a law enforcement agency, uh, in addition to a process for a law enforcement agency to make a good faith determination about the law enforcement officer's conduct. Um, S-254 does not go into that level of detail. Uh, from my research, it does appear that some of these were implemented sort of after a year of being into effect. Uh, specifically, um, it was mentioned in previous testimony that there was this town that sort of preemptively uh, said that it would never uh, consider uh, a law enforcement officer to have acted in bad faith. A recent revision to the Colorado law um, specifically prohibits that. It says that they cannot, or rather an employer, shall not preemptively determine whether a peace officer, their definition of a law enforcement officer, acted in good faith before such action in question has occurred. Uh, so while I wasn't uh, aware of that specific instance of hap uh, hap happening, I do believe that this later revision to the law is probably a response to that. Um, however, going into more detail as far as the major substantive revisions, and there are differences as to form and language. The S-254 incorporates language that's more common to Vermont law, uh, and obviously the cross-references to Vermont statutes are, are different than the cross-references to similar statutes in Colorado. Uh, but the main major substantive difference has been talked about a lot are, are the broader, is the broader basis under which a claim could be brought. Um, the law, Colorado law only permits actions that are based on violations of, quote, any individual rights that create binding obligations on government actors secured by the Bill of Rights, Article 2 of the Colorado State Constitution. So, for example, one such right and corresponding obligation that's contained in that article is Colorado's search and seizure provision. S-254 does something similar to that. Um, you know, an individual may bring a civil action for an alleged violation of Vermont's constitutional rights, like our own search and seizure article. However, the difference is the, the ability to bring an action for a common law tort, like negligence of a, of a law enforcement officer, or when a statute confers a substantive right. So those would be things that could be like an excessive use of force, which we, we have set statutory standards around, or the use of uh, electronic recordings during custodial interrogation and the rights associated with that, or drone surveillance um, and the, the warrant and uh, other exigency requirements by law enforcement and those. So those are other statutory violations that could be brought um, if an individual officer had a role in that, in this case. Um, so again, broader bases 
for an action be brought under this section than just the constitutional violations that Colorado has. And can you give a couple examples of common law? What would be under, um, I understand statutory because I, that would be in the green books, sure. like the use of drones, but give me a couple examples of common law because I'm not sure, I'm not an attorney, so I have no idea what that means really. So, yeah, of course, and those would be what, Previous testimony said, you know, intentional torts, which would be assault, battery, um, potentially false imprisonment, um, or negligence, um, which would be, you know, a law enforcement officer has a duty to act in a certain way. He breached that duty, and then there was a damage damage that resulted from that. Um, so those would be those common law torts as opposed to statutory rights that. Um, could be that would be swept in by this statute by this bill so i have in one of my notes somewhere here i have written down defamation of character i have no idea why i wrote that down but i wrote it down under common law yeah, that that is a common law tort as well um and defamation can you know is essentially libelous or slanderous um you know statements uh, that are untrue. Truth is always offense to defamation. Um, but yes, technically, if uh, I suppose it's conceivable that if a law enforcement officer in the course of their duties made a public statement that defamed someone and that somehow caused injury, there could be redress there. Um, but, but again, it has to be within the course of or scope of duty um, of the law enforcement officer. But it wouldn't have to cause physical injury. It says injury or damage. And so that could be damage to one's reputation. Correct. Okay. Um, going forward on the differences between the two, um, the scope of immunity that's waived is also different in S-254 compared to the Colorado law. Colorado does explicitly exclude qualified immunity. The way S-254 is written, if you look at subsection C of uh, proposed 5607, it talks about common law doctrines of immunity uh, as a defense to liability. So that would include what we were talking about earlier, both absolute immunity and qualified immunity. And you know, we're kind of getting into the legal weeds on these concepts, but they're important to understand. And really, the, in general, the concept of official immunity and absolute immunity and qualified immunity is, der is a derivative of that concept, protects government officials from civil liability. Um, and it generally defeats lawsuits at their outset. Um, absolute immunity is generally afforded to judges, legislators, and the highest executive officials where the acts complained of are performed within the respective authorities, and it applies to all acts performed within the um, individual's authority, regardless of malicious motive or intent. So it truly is an absolute immunity, as opposed to qualified, which applies to lower level government officials, employees, and agents, like law enforcement officers. Um, it, it, immunity extends to these individuals when they perform discretionary acts in good faith during the course of their employment and within the scope of authority. So that's the qualification of that, that immunity concept. Um, and good faith, as we've talked about, exists where an official's acts did not violate clearly established rights of which a reason, an official reasonably would have known. So in, in the bill here, it covers both absolute and qualified. So this is Conceiv it's conceivable that if, uh, say, the commissioner of public safety, if they are a law enforcement officer by definition and they engage in something within the scope of their duties um, and it causes injury uh, and a claim is brought under this bill, it's conceivable that they would be held civilly liable. Can I, can I ask it? Oh, go ahead, Senator White, then I'll ask the question. But if, but if the commissioner is not a law enforcement agency, he or she would be covered by the absolute immunity. Right. This is only if you are a law enforcement officer acting within <clears throat> those duties or under the color of law. Well, I'm looking at page three of the bill, section E. 
and it says um, the only time this is I'm paraphrasing now, the only time the officer would be liable and not be indemnified by the law enforcement agency for a judgment up to 25,000 or 5%, whichever is less, is when the law enforcement agency determines that the officer did not act in good faith and under reasonable belief the action was lawful. Um, Wilder White used the example of uh, the uh, homeless encampment in Burlington and the, and the mayor orders it to be um, taken down and the police go and do that. <clears throat> and then the police officer would be liable. And under this, doesn't that take away that liability since they operated in good faith and they believed that the mayor's order was, li was lawful? Well, you know, a, every situation is fact dependent, so I have to qualify it by that. But in, in that situation, you know, while this gets rid of qualified immunity as a defense, it doesn't get rid of traditional affirmative defenses that are used in civil litigation. So, for instance, there is the concept of a good faith defense um, that could potentially be pled um, by a law enforcement officer in in that circumstance. So, you know, and again, this concept of qualified immunity and what is considered clearly established law, you know, it, it really is it, it good faith, clearly established law is within that good faith analysis. Um, and really, the analysis doesn't even end there. It's um, they're acting within the scope of their authority. They're acting in good faith and their actions are discretionary or as opposed to ministerial. So a lot of times the courts don't even get to that next step because they can't get past the clearly established law uh, step in the analysis. Um, so while qualified immunity would not be available and good faith is part of that, affirm the affirmative defense of good faith could conceivably be used by the officer in civil litigation. So I don't, I don't think under this law that it, it gets rid of that defense from that concept as opposed to the qualified immunity concept. If, if that answers your question, Senator Sears. Very helpful, Senator uh, Ben. Thank you. Other questions for Ben or comments? I, I hate to be really thick here, but I need more explanation of lines 12 through 17 on page two, because I really do not understand what that means at all. And I know you just went through that it excludes. Um, I really don't understand what that is saying at all. It says that the, the um, an action pursuant to this section, meaning of a suit filed, right, is not subject to what does that mean? It means that they can't. Uh, and what, what page are you referring to, Senator Lynn? Sorry. Page two, lines 12 through 17. And if, if, if everybody else understands this, I can, I can take this offline and talk to Ben because I really don't understand what it's saying at all. So just, just let me know if I should take it offline. Well, I, I think it's a, a valid question. No, um, I think that's a good question. So go ahead. And so it's essentially, it's it's a little bit of legalese. I'll I'll, I'll grant you that, Senator White. Yeah. So, but it basically says that these are not at play in this bill. So when you bring an action under this section, you can't use the common law doctrines of immunity as a defense. You can't use statutory immunities and statutory li limitations and liability damages or attorney's fees. The provisions of Chapter 189, which is the Vermont Tort Claims Act, that doesn't apply here. And then the provisions of 24 VSA Chapter 33, sub, four, sub Chapter 4, which is the municipal equivalent of the Vermont Tort Claims Act. So those provisions don't come at play when an action is brought under uh, this section. But, under this but I, I thought one and two are what we're dealing with here. Well, we, we are, but these are also additional exclusions. Um, for instance, 
under the Vermont Tort Claims Act, acts can only be brought against the state, not against right. individuals. And, and similarly with the municipal uh, equivalent. So it's just saying that these can't be used to sort of supersede the provisions contained in this bill or law if it goes into effect. I get three and four. I don't get one and two, how that applies, because I thought that's what we were saying is you couldn't. So what we're, so what one and two says is that you cannot use the um, a doctrine of immunity, either qualified or absolute immunity as a defense. Correct. OK. Uh, OK. And, and section and subdivision two in that goes into statutory immunity, immunities and limitations on liability, damages, or attorney's fees, because there are other statutes that sometimes dictate how much, uh, whether attorney's fees are applied or limitations on, on liability and damage amounts. So it's saying that those are excluded from actions brought under this as well. Um. Joe, he's not looking at you, so. No, he's not. I understand. Oh, I'm sorry, Hi, Joe. Sir, I, I was looking at the bill. Go ahead, Joe. So, Ben, tell me, what are the statutory immunities and limitations that we are now eliminating under this bill? So, for instance. We obviously, we've obviously created statutes that have provided specific immunities and limitations. I'm really interested in knowing what specific pieces of legislation we are sweeping away by implementing this bill. So specifically these, for instance, insurance. A lot of times the state waves or municipality waves and there are statutes on this. It's uh, you know, 24 VSA uh, 304, 24 VSA 1092, um, and then 20, 29 VSA 1403. Those are statutes that talk about insurance coverage. And there's this concept, and it's actually written in, in statute as well, that the state or municipality can waive its immunity um, to the extent of its insurance coverage. So that's saying in this case, those wouldn't apply here. And the provisions that we're talking about as far as indemnification and insurance and payment, those come into play as far as what would apply in this, in this potential statute. So this statute does not deal with the government entities that are being sued. It deals with the individual officer. Mm -hmm. Are there any statutes that surround individual officers for protection purposes that this statement is eliminating? Well, traditionally and under, under statute, the state or municipality um, essentially represents uh, claims against individuals within its jurisdiction. So but that would not be happening now with this bill. Well, correct. And this, it, what, what it's saying is that rather than the state having to, or a municipality having to come in and represent uh, a law enforcement officer or a state police officer, um, they themselves have to defend themselves or pursuant to the, the contours of this bill. But they don't have to pay except for $25,000 if they act in bad faith. So while they have to hire their own lawyer to defend them, if they're found to be liable, then the agency would pay. Correct, that, that's, that's the limitation on, on liability for the officers, that $25,000 or 5%, whichever is less. But they have to hire their own attorney and... Yes. What if you took that out? Okay. No, I mean, what would happen? Well, if you, if you took that out, then traditional, the traditional representation or, uh, you know, it's, it's, you could also call it kind of a form of indemnification when the state or municipality is providing an attorney. 
they would still be able to do that if you were to take that provision out. Yeah, I mean, I don't mean take out the, I meant just take out the 5% or 25,000 so that the police officer, um, obviously there are cases where police officers, you know, the Chauvin, the George Floyd, the police officer there obviously had to hire his own defense team. So, you know, there are cases that go beyond. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious of what the impact would be so the individual police officer, um, you know, you don't have that requirement, whether it was good faith or reasonable belief. You, I mean, the, they sue the, the police officer, but the town, the town of Bennington or St. Albans or whatever is indemnifying, is providing the insurance as it is today. Mm -hmm. So if you were to take out the 5% or 25,000, I mean, it would essentially indemnify them completely. If it, Well, but they'd still be held responsible under. I mean, when right. you limit it to, to, I'm not sure what, in reality, what that does. Well, so if you were to eliminate the personal liability on the officer to $25,000 or 5% if essentially they act in bad faith, then the law enforcement agency would step in and cover them completely. So they can be found civilly liable. But I heard from several town managers that that's what they were going to do. Okay. Um, well, that's, and that's ultimately up to the municipality or the law enforcement agency to make that determination. They don't make the determination, then they can completely cover any liability that is attached to the officer. And, 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 and again, if you look at section subsection F, and, and Senator White, I believe this is a concern that you had raised earlier. The, the effect of that is that no matter what, if that person, if the law enforcement officer can't make the payment, then either the law enforcement agency or the insurer will cover that payment. Right. I just got this feeling that this this has placed a lot of pressure on, as law enforcement reads it, now they're, you know, and I'm not sure that this does, I mean, I, I suppose it could be, you know, 2,500, not 25,000, or it could have been 100,000. I mean, I, I'm not sure. And, and the amount the amount itself is really a policy consideration. Um, and and this, these amounts were inspired by the Colorado law. Right, I understand um, that. I, that's, you know, I mean, we, when we were drafting this and our discussions with you, it was mainly you know, Colorado and how they did it. So I'm, I'm just, I'm just questioning whether or not that would, if that's necessary, what it accomplishes. Well, really, I mean, and, and this is sort of the, I guess, the evolution of a court case, right, is that you have the people that are found liable, and then you have this sort of separate piece about who pays. And so if we don't really if, if it's determined that who actually pays isn't as important as who is held responsible, then you can feel free to change the amounts or eliminate that aspect of the law altogether. Um, I, think, I think the import of that is to ensure that a plaintiff who sues and is successful in, in their lawsuit can collect the money from somebody. Yeah. And I, and I'm not, changing that i'm i'm just there's something what's i guess what's missing here is i just read in the newspaper i didn't want to bring it up well david slay was testifying because he's representing one of the troopers but three troopers were have been sued i believe for five million each um in a case in shaftesbury uh so Obviously, that's way above this. And I don't know what qualified immunity will do or won't do for any of that, but they're being sued. So they're, they're facing that. And I'm, 
assuming that since David Slay is representing one of them, it's, it's you know part of his legal business. <clears throat> but I'm questioning what it does to require each trooper, each police officer, law enforcement officer, to be responsible for up to twenty five thousand dollars. Well, I, I think that's sort of a, a level of personal accountability. Um, okay. But, but yeah. again, that's sort of a policy decision when, if that's really where we want to go with the bill. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just uh, trying to understand what it accomplishes. Yeah. And it, it seems to me that, that if, if it's found that the officer acted in bad faith, then they ought to bear some responsibility. I don't know what the amount is, but if if it's found that they acted in, uh, I'm not as concerned about this because if, the, if, if they're found to have acted in bad faith and vi really violated intentionally, then, then they should be held responsible for that. And my guess is that they would be held responsible by the certifying agency and their their town, they'd probably lose their job. But the, in the meantime, the town is stuck for to pay for somebody who acted in bad faith. And that's that's the only time that they wouldn't be 100% indemnified. So I have less concerns about that than uh, still about lines 13 and 14. I still okay. don't understand. Well, them. it being noontime, I think we should probably oh. call it a day. 